in accordance with the provisions of the Open Public Meetings Act, NJSA 10, colon 4-6, PL 1975, C-231-S1, amended 2006, C-70-S2, the Asbury Park Board of Education has provided adequate notice of this meeting by sending a notice of the time, date, location, to the extent known the agenda of this meeting to the Asbury Park Press and the new coaster on January 27, 2023, via email. Copies of this notice have also been placed in the Administrative Building Bulletin Board, District Schools, Asbury Park Municipal Building, Asbury Park Police Department, and filed with the City Clerk on January 27, 2023. Asbury Park School District will provide all students with a comprehensive and progressive education where everyone possesses the skills and character to succeed in a diverse, evolving global society. Roll call, please. Mr. Grillo? Ms. Lazinski? Here. Dr. Penna? Mr. Remy? Here. Ms. Ricks? Here. Mr. Rogers? Here. Mr. Saunders? Ms. Ms. Allsbay? Ms. Cook? We have a quorum. Please stand for the salute to the flag. several presentations. Um, first present, part of the presentations will be our normal staff and student monthly recognition. Then we will have our data presentation. Um, and prior to that, I would like to uh, welcome some of our student advisory committee members that are in the audience this evening. Um, our student Nate, raise your hand Nate, from MLK. Great. So with further, no further ado, we'll start with um, MLK. Uh, we have Ms. Hope Witter who will be standing in for Mr. Medina this evening. So Ms. Witter, I mean Ms. Hope Walk, uh, come on up. Samantha Salmoran. This is for you. I have known Samantha, because I will cry, <laughs> for the last, I guess, three, four years. I had her, <laughs> sorry, in fifth grade as my pullout. I had her for our novel group. I had her in sixth grade for my Read 180 class, and she left me, and I was very upset. She came back to us, and I have her now for reading with the most amazing group of students. Sam, you are a mentor to me, to your students, to the community, and I thank you, and I can't wait every A day to see your face and to help me lead your students, your, your friends, and as well as me. You have taught me so much in the last four years. And Dad, you should be so proud of your child. Yes, she did get an A, just so you know. <laughs> she is absolutely wonderful. Dad, come up. I can't say enough about Samantha or my Sammy. Yeah. And without further 
further ado for MLK, our Teacher of the Month, actually Staff of the Month, Mr. Brian Hackett. <laughs> Not only, this is on behalf of Mr. Medina, come here, sweetie, and, and the staff at MLK, I can't thank you enough, Mr. Medina, myself, Jackie, the Climate and Culture Committee. You have done such a wonderful job. I can't thank you enough for everything you have done. You are just not a colleague. You are just not a guidance counselor. You're my therapist. You're one of my best friends. I am so proud to call you my colleague, my friend, and teacher of the month, staff member of the month. I am my Thank you, everyone. Oh, sorry, Mom. Hey, come up here, Mom. 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 Thank you. Mom, we see you for the second time. Ms. O'Neill, principal of Asbury Park High School. School Staff Member of the Month. Um, this person is a pillar of the high school community. She is often the person who is welcoming our students for the first time when they're arriving to the country for the first time. She is so patient in helping them understand who we are as a community, making sure that they're getting the services that they need, and her classroom might be the com most calming space that we have in the high school. She is someone that comes to every meeting with ideas. She does not expect anybody to come up with the ideas on their own. She wants to collaborate. She brings solutions. It's been incredible to work with her, and students come back to see her talk about the impact that they've had on her on their lives many years past graduation. It's Miss Tracy Oldock, our ELL teacher at the high school. Yeah. And we 
said, okay, we have to help him out and maybe give him enough. So we have a, a book bag full. And then when he comes in, he comes and he raids our candy jars and the snack dishes. So we have a whole bag of snacks for him, right? Let's go. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. We, we appreciate everything you do. Thank you, Dr. Schwartz. Schultz, excuse me. Good evening, everyone. It is with great delight that we present our Thurgood Marshall Student of the Month this evening. Before I share his name with you, I'd like to just speak a little about him. This student was in our school for several years through his elementary journey, and we are so delighted to have him back this year as a fifth grader. He has shown an exemplary model of what a Thurgood Marshall student should be, so much so that he has chosen to peer mentor some of our younger students. He personally requested that I monitor his behavior and academics throughout the first marking period so that he could be on our safety patrol. And he is overall just very respectful, helpful, and kind to all of our Thurgood community. He has also requested that his teacher, Mr. Hamilton, and his former third grade teacher, Mrs. Vasico Knox, be here tonight to share in this honor. Mom and Dad, please be very proud of your precious son, Mr. Night King Cox. Please come up and accept your award. And he made sure to dress in his best for us this evening. Mom and Dad, please come join us. And in true Thurgood fashion, a, ba a backpack of all Night King's favorite items. Staff Member of the Month. This month's nominee received the most votes by his peers and colleagues by a landslide. He has been described by his colleagues as someone who is respectful, helpful, dedicated, tirelessly serving our Thurgood Marshall community, always willing to lend a smile and a helping hand, and in my personal experience as his principal this school year, he has been so accommodating and flexible with ensuring that students are always supported, staff are always supported, and the building runs smoothly. His staff, his staff member of the month nomination came this week on his birthday. So to our wonderful gym teacher, Mr. Scott Baldwin, please come up and rightfully accept your award and happy belated birthday. Very well deserved. <laughs> Thank you. Congratulations to all of our staff and students for the month of November. Um, Mr. Ruiz, are you ready? Yeah. Okay. So we're going to move into our presentation for the NJSLA um, report. So we'll give a few minutes if parents you want to go ahead and kind of like usher out like right before the offering. <laughs> That's hilarious. Those those of us who scooted out. 
right before the offering play was passed around because we don't spend it on candy at the store. They get the joke. So while we're um, letting the projector warm up, um, you want to open the screen? Is that it? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Part of our requirement uh, for the those in attendance is each year we have to provide an update on our NJSLA um, data. What we are going to be presenting today is that information from the 22-23 <clears throat> NJSLA data. A few of the slides in the beginning, and I want to kind of add context to this, in the, you'll see a comparison of the 18, now for those of you who kind of can't see, like, like myself, um, I do apologize. So I'm going to have to kind of get close to read this because I left my glasses in the car. No, I can't borrow your reading glasses. Our prescription may not be the same. I, I might take a step and then next thing you know, I'm on my knees. Okay, so what you have presented here, we're going to show you the ELA, mathematics, and science. No, I'm fine. You'll see here that we look at the 2018-2019 data, then 2021, 2022, and then present year 2020 to 2023. And it's broken down from third grade up until ninth grade, and then it gives the overall ELA score for those years. Now what you'll notice is in 2019 and 2020, the state did not require the NJSLA, and in the following year of 2020, 2021, that was also a recurring event in terms of the, stat, the state suspended state testing during that time. So what you'll see here is a comparison to the last time we were fully in session with our uh, state requirements in terms of testing for third grade, up until this past year. What you'll also notice that it is broken down into the number of results, not meeting, partially meeting, approaching, and meeting, and then exceeding. So those are the categories in which the NJSLA is broken down in each area. What you'll also notice in the meeting area, there's some green highlights. Boom, boom. Um, those green highlights. Those green highlights are us meeting, and then you'll see the difference between the previous year. So for the 2021, 2022, we were at 8% in meeting in third grade, and that decreased to 4% in meeting in third grade. In fourth grade, we were at 11% in 2021, 2022, and increased to 13%. And you'll see for fifth grade, we went from 6% to 11%. We went from, in sixth grade, excuse me, we went from 6% to 8%. Seventh grade, again, a 2% increase. And eighth grade, a 1% increase. And then you see in ninth grade, um, from ELA from 2021 to 2022, there was a 13% decrease. Mr. Roots, next slide. When we look at it, again, also in the cohort, approaching, meeting, and exceeding. And these are numbers that we have to present and provide. So we increased from a third grade to fourth grade in the cohort by 7% from 7 to 14. In fifth grade from fourth to fifth, we decreased by 3%. In our fifth to sixth grade cohort, we increased by three. 6th to 7th increased by 2, 7th to 8th increased by 3, 
And from eighth to ninth grade, we increased by 23. And you can still see the same dynamic in terms of the highlights, in terms of math. So overall, go back to science. So one of the things that we have been focusing in on last year is our ELA academies for our teachers, as well as this summer, focusing in on our math academies during the summer for our staff with our curriculum instruction department. So you'll see, again, those green highlights where we recognize we stayed, were stable in some areas and again, still exceptionally low. In our science areas, again, our 11th grade um, is the only area that showed improvement of 1%. So as we look at the analysis, and Mr. Ruiz will come up in a second, we have a tremendous amount of work to do. We have been focusing in on ELA this year, excuse me, last year. This year we continue to focus on that across the board. And we've shown to see some gains over the last two years. Are they significant? No, they're not. I would be sitting here not being factual and honest with the numbers standing before us. In gaining what we have, we think about the tremendous obstacles in which we have been dealing with not only coming back from COVID, instructional loss, utilizing our ESSER funds, and then also dealing with the significant decrease in funding across the board. So when we look at not only our academic programs being impacted by the $27 million cuts over the last several years, we're also looking at stabilizing instruction, implementing process and procedures, and building capacity in not only our staff, but our administrators, and doing that on a shoestring budget. So as Mr. Ruiz will come up and kind of go over some of these different levels. I wanted to give you an overview, not to hear from the director of CNI, but to hear from me about these numbers. Are there any questions before I let Mr. Ruiz go through the following presentation? Mr. Rogers, use your microphone, please. Yeah, in the first column, that, that is the number of students as a result. That's the total number of students that were tested. And the number in the first column is those that were tested in each grade. So what, what, what was our percentage of decreasing students over these last couple of years? Our total number of student decrease in terms of enrollment? Yeah. I, can, I would have to give you that, that number. I don't have that off the top of my head. OK. And how much did we decrease that? How much did we what? So, actually, workers, not administrators. Across the board, when we start talking about reduction of staff, that can go into whether we had staff through attrition or reduction. So, we also stayed, saved 58 positions through use of $6 million worth of ESSER funds during the 21 22 school year. So, had we not utilized that $6 million worth of ESSER funds, our reduction in staff would have been extremely larger. So I would have to be able to give you that information re regarding the reduction in terms of the decrease of our student enrollment 
as well as our staff enrollment. If you can get that to me. I'll get it to the board. No problem. Anyone else? Mr. Rim, the microphone is on, so I guess you're up. Okay, I'm just trying to find a way to word this question. Uh, Take your time. So like I see major increases in certain sections, like not meeting, like. Talk it to your microphone so that, that way it can be picked up. I see certain sections, um, like not meeting, what do you think causes us to not meet the criteria? Um, I'm just looking at one grade right now. Uh, which slide are you looking at, the math? Yes. Okay, can you go back to the math? Yeah, here we go. No, the math cohort, or let me see, hold on. The, the cohort, the cohort. Um, cohort, so, yes. So it's great, 2021-2022 yeah. is great. Yeah, gotcha. math, And they end up becoming eighth grade, 2022-2023. Same amount of students, or same amount of numbers, but it goes from 33 to 71 of not meeting. So what do you think is the... So there are considerable reasons for that, right? There can be the complexity and the rigor of the standard. It can be um, test sophistication. It can be the actual application and the understanding of the content. So when we begin to look at the increase of partial meeting, not meeting, and approaching, we have been having our meetings with our principals about strategically and intentionally looking at who those students are. Not only from this cohort data, we should be able to identify who those students are, where, what teachers they have, looking at the standards in which those students have struggled in the previous year, looking at the linked information data that we have given our students now, and begin to intentionally identify instructional approaches to decrease those numbers from students that are partially meeting and approaching, and hopefully we'll see gains in the meeting. That will be aligned with our content area supervisors going in and providing support, the principals identifying that through INRS, um, as well with, within INRS, students that have, may have failed or struggled in the market period, having other uh, challenges such as attendance, and so there are a lot of different variables that we are intentionally looking at to decrease those numbers. So one of the things that we have been focusing on as a district over the last, going into this third year, is addressing instruction. So for the last two years, we've been dealing with a lot of other things that have been not centered on instruction. And we've made minor gains despite those obstacles. The teachers have been working hard, so have the supervisors, and we've been really intentionally looking at all of the dynamics that go into what we've been doing. We've moved away from being a district that has been heavily intervention-based, and now looking at our core programs and assessing their effectiveness in order to address the academic concerns that we see. I'm gonna jump off. Question to, to go a little bit further. We have parents, and I hope people are watching this. These, these test scores or averages represent each individual child in this district. And I want to know if every, every parent came in, do we get an individual analysis of this so they can know where their child is weak, where they're strong? So to answer that question, we are required by law to send home individual results to each family. This is not 
an individual. This is an overall percentage and average, right? So this does not reflect individual students. This reflects us as a whole. And so I want to be clear, as we look at these numbers, these are numbers that have been in existence for a long time. But we're addressing them very transparent. That's why these numbers are up here and I'm not you know, skirting around these single digit numbers. I've been very clear in saying, hit your microphone. No, I was about to say, I think I get what he mean when he asked that question. Um, so it's basically like, if, if that's, I'm gonna use myself as an example, if I'm failing and you notice it this early on, what can happen, what can change, what are we gonna do to change that by the time the school year ends, that I'm not in this not meeting, I'm at least at the approaching or meeting if I'm not exceeding. That's a... Uh, Thank you. So to answer that question, that, that is when we start addressing tier one instruction, which begins in the classroom, looking at lesson plans, looking at accommodations for our students in special needs and ELL. If I was to show you those numbers, we have not moved that needle at all in terms of special needs students and English language learners in a very, very long time. And part of our building audits and that binder that has been available and accessible to board members to come and, and view and look at the information that we've collected will give you more of an insight to how we are planning on approaching this. But this presentation is to provide the overview and to meet the requirement of presenting this data, not only in public, but also to address some of the findings in which we are addressing instructionally day to day. and the CNI committee, as well as Dr. Simmons, will go into greater detail as to our pivoting in terms of our fiscal cost for the after school, but we're not ending the after school program. Okay, so I, I think that we, I don't want to convolute this presentation with some of the things that are on the agenda item that have explanations that are not necessarily connected to this, although we're still addressing some of the other concerns that we have in terms of providing instructional supports for students. You wanna to flip to the last couple of slides? Again, what we have here is the same thing that I went over in terms of the first few slides, but I wanted to give you a comparison. Science, again, demographic information, we've broken it down to male and female. Uh, science is fifth and eighth grade. We'll see, oops, slide back. Fifth, eighth grade, and eleventh grade. Our demographic information. This is broken down into uh, gender, male and female. And it's broken elementary, middle, and high school and then all grades. That's for math, science, and ELA. Again, free reduced lunch, again, demographics for ELA, for 504, ELL, special ed, gen ed, and all students. And again, in elementary school, middle school, and high school um, groupings. So some of our action plans. Continue ELA year long. A and B schedule to align the state assessment schedule. Professional development focusing on information writing and informative writing. One-on-one -on -one teacher feedback 
from ELA classroom visits with our supervisors as well as our principals. Grade level articulation on what informational writing should look like with exemplars using scaffolding and instructional resources. Using district resources such as iReady, iXL, Lincoln, English 3D for ELL students, and connecting to the district goals. One of the things for our math in terms of our schools working with their annual school plans, again, small group differentiated instruction that are standards based. The activities are based upon common assessment data, utilizing Linkit. Um, again, when you ask about Mr. Remy, how are we addressing in terms of students before they get to that in part, our snapshots, utilizing our, bench, uh, our Linkit benchmark assessment. Problem solving, focus on the NJSLA uh, standards. And again, connecting to our math supervisors, district goals, as well as our overall academic goals for writing across the curriculum in all content areas. Science is one of the areas that we have definitely been honing in on because we have not seen success in fifth grade, eighth grade, or 11th grade, and that's been um, for some time. So we move from semester-based science to year-long. Again, working on conceptual understanding and much more hands-on activities in our science classes. Standards-based instruction, addressing the major standards at the beginning of the year and doing them year-long with support from additional standards at the end. Our three standard-based benchmarks to provide us with some snapshots on where we are, how our students are doing. Pacing, looking at our units to make sure that our pacing is not too fast that, and it's not too slow, and that it's covering the information and the skills that our students should be being exposed to. Our K-5 to science program, which includes in our daily schedule, Again, it's one, of one day per week for STEM instruction. Uh, the teachers are engineering concepts, so those are some of the things that we're working on in terms of expanding students' metacognition and their inquisition about problem solving and thinking. And then again, connecting that to our science supervisor's district goal. Dr. Adams, before you sit down, um, I've always had an issue with demographic percentages. Reason being is, if, if you tell me 50% of people are doing well and 50% aren't, I don't know what that number still is because it could be six people and only three are passing. You, you get what I'm saying? So is there a way that we can do something where people can get a better understanding like maybe ratio or... So when you look at your, um, and what we presented, if you see something with less than 10, that means that number was not significant enough to be counted. So that's not a, a stat that we'll, that's judged against us, right? But when we look at our numbers in terms of the larger percentage of not meeting uh, partially meeting and approaching. That's where we begin to pull out and try to identify those blocks of students in those areas, in those grades, and see what standards those students are struggling with and begin to address them at that grade. Begin to provide professional development during our delayed openings. Um, again, try to crosswalk that with informational text. That's the reason why we're focused on informational writing across all content areas because that's different than narrative. That's much more detailed in terms of informational writing. That's a skill that students can translate into other areas, not only just in ELA, but in math and in science. I've got a question, Dr. Adams. Um, with professional development, isn't that what we're doing right now when we have delayed openings and professional development with, with the 
educators. Like, I, I'm just trying to figure out the difference between what we've been doing and what we want to do in terms of professional development. So to answer your question, one of the things that we have not done that we have been doing over the last two years is our teacher academies during the summer, right. right, where we bring in teachers who volunteer and we actually pay them over the course of the summer. We bring in um, consultants to work with our teachers. Not only we worked with ELA this year, we started with math, and we centralized our focus on, again, informational text. Yeah, and we're actually in the middle of utilizing a consultant to work with our teachers in the area of science. And the, the second question I had was, um, just because a lot of folks probably don't understand what it means, can you explain ongoing PLC, CPT? Ongoing means it's, it's regular, it's weekly. It's right, but I'm, I'm talking about PLC, CPT for data-driven decision-making. So There's, one of the things, so... Yeah. Data driven, this is data. These are the numbers. One of the things that we have been doing is looking at professional learning communities, which is, you know, PLC, right? And developing the capacity of teachers as well as utilizing um, best practices in terms of instructional best practices, right? Utilizing instructional resources that will enhance what the students are um, being exposed to, as well as addressing the instructional modalities, meaning how teachers are actually teaching, what they are actually teaching, the resources and materials. Are we utilizing uh, centers in the elementary school? Are those centers tiered, meaning they have, let's say, level one, level two, and level three? Do they have modifications for students that are special needs? Do they have um, lessons that are modified for students who are English language learners? Those are all things that we are focusing on um, much more intentionally than has been done in the past. And the minor results that you have seen in terms of those highlights, those don't happen without being intentional. Is that what it means by modeling in classrooms, or does that mean something different? Modeling in classrooms? Yeah. That means demonstration. That means uh, in the common planning. So there are a variety of ways. Okay. Thank you. All right, I got another question. Um, so how long do you think it will take to before we start seeing some improvement with the action steps being implemented? Well, I mean, those highlights, they were, they were zero. We, we, were, we were lower than that, right? And I think we are steadily focused on the reality that the struggles that we have as a district, given the resources that we have, the challenge that we have with not only coming back from the COVID academic loss, and you look at the 2021-2022 um, school year, to where we are presently. So this year, again, we are working on addressing 90% of our instruction is going to be driven by standards-based, looking at the data, the results from our linkage results, which are a benchmark, and strategically planning a course of action in ELA, math, and science to address what those results give us. I, I couldn't stand here and say, you know, I'm going to go to this classroom and have this teacher do this or go to this school and mandate this happen. This is a systematic process of dealing with the reality that, one, these results are not good. The staff knows that. The community knows that. I believe the staff is working 
hard to write what they've, what, what they've seen historically, these results don't happen without the hard work of the teachers. You can really clap. Right? It doesn't happen. Even incrementally. Right? And so we're dealing with a very uphill challenge. And we've been very real about that. Um, we've been very honest about that. The teachers have been very open. And the reality is, this is a very difficult conversation to not only have in public. It's like opening up, you know, your, your chest cavity and, and seeing all your internal organs. This is not a, you know, a pretty conversation to have, but it is a necessary conversation. It is an honest conversation. It has to be one done with compassion. It has to be one done with understanding that these results are not the failures of children. These are not the results of the failures of people who don't care who come to work every day. The reality is there's a lot of work to be done. There is a lot of work being done. But the reality is we cannot avoid looking at these numbers and remotely being satisfied with a 2%, 3% gain at all. But I would be honest with you, if we saw 78% Coming up on this screen come next year, I can tell you right now, every federal education agency will be in here doing an audit to, to, to check and see what, what happened, what type of cheating was going on. And that's not going to happen either. The hard work has to be consistent. It has to be transparent. It has to be, again, consistent. All right? Thank you. That concludes my report. Report of the committees. Ms. Ricks, you want to go first since we uh, just did all that? Good evening, everyone. This is a report from the Curriculum and Instruction Committee. Uh, we met last week. We only had a few things on our agenda. And one was the recommendation to approve the New Jersey Department of Education Division of Early Childhood Services, a three-year preschool program operational plan. And the other was also to collaborate with Life Support Training in Jersey Shore University Medical Center to conduct a hard safest first aid and CPR AED training session for preschool staff. And uh, we also discussed sending eight teachers to the Teachers Academy Literacy, which was held on November 2nd at a rate of 21, I'm sorry, $41 an hour. Uh, the names are listed here, and we discussed briefly the school journeys. That concludes my report. Uh, thank you, Ms. Ricks. Uh, athletics, did, uh, I wasn't at the athletics. Did, was, uh, any, uh, you weren't here, Anthony? Dr. Adams, do you have a brief overview of athletics? Friendship game is this hour. Uh, that concludes. 
Also, uh, B&G, Mr. Crow. Thank you, Mr. Lissinski. Um, so uh, we met uh, November 8th, um, an update. We, uh, we're given an update on the ESSER funded projects, all schools will have engineers doing punch list walkthroughs. Um, well, they did the walkthroughs, right? Um, Dr. Simmons, um, for mechanical and electrical work. And then um, for MLK, the electrical distribution panel that was expected to arrive in late December has actually already arrived. Um, and there'll be coordination with the contractor on installation for a date. Dr. Simmons, did we get a date for that? No, we don't have a date, but um, okay. I had known Mr. Sosa did have meetings today to coordinate that. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, an update on the water damage from the October storms. Glad to know it wasn't just my house. Um, most of the damage from flooding due to the rising water from the lake happened at the high school and over at the stadium. Uh, contractors and insurance adjusters have come out. Uh, we're waiting for additional estimates. We haven't gotten any other additional, okay. So the preliminary estimate is about $135,000. In terms of updates for each school, uh, emergent facility items needed to be budgeted for. Um, we have uh, at Thurgood Marshall $109,000 that includes uh, replacing an en energy recovery unit on the roof, uh, some upper roof repairs, and um, pointing of the northeast corner of the building. At the high school, um, it's about $153,000 emergent facility items that includes phase two of the cosmetology class, right? And uh, about $8,000 in fitness equipment repairs to the weight room. And then at MLK, it's $40,000 that includes 16K towards roof repairs. And then um, finally getting a new phone system. Uh, the phone system there is obsolete and it's not repairable anymore. So uh, we're going to begin this with a, uh, an implementation. Uh, it's a three-year plan impl implementation uh, in order to make all classroom pho phones district-wide uh, operation. Security update. So Mr. Sosa has been working with the principals and the staff to deal with security concerns that I'm sure we as a board and also the community at large have um, that have not been addressed um, recently. Uh, due to the concerns that have been occurring at MLK and that Mr. Jordan had not addressed, um, Mr. Sosa has added two additional security guards, making it four in total uh, that are assigned to MLK. Um, and additionally, at this board meeting, we're going to be voting, uh, well, we're going to be making a recommendation to assign two more part-time officers to MLK in staggered shifts in order to have four officers at all times, uh, even when staff calls out. Uh, then we have the emergency alert system, SHARE 911, uh, that, we, that we have, but it hasn't been updated uh, or fully operational, so we're going to be getting that um, up and running uh, uh, as soon as possible. So. Mr. Sosa also spent hours working on updating the system for features that were not implemented properly in the past, so that way it functions properly. Um, and the SHARE 911 system launched this past Monday. Um, were there any issues or anything with it? No, and staff, um, if they haven't already, we'll be getting um, emails and messages indicating that the system is now live. Um, if there's, a, there's also a function, um, being that all the whoever was in the database when it was last revised, if you got an email or a text message, and it's not, you know, privy to you. You just could hit the stop button and it'll stop. Okay. So it just allows the system to now come back online. And now any emergency throughout the district, um, in particular, that school will know about it. But more importantly, administrators throughout the school district will know about it. And that will allow us to keep in line with um, just being aware of things. We are also working on um, recertifying um, not just... Um, not just the administration, but the security officers. We're going to be um, 
working with um, the state to come and do some um, one-on-ones with the officers, some lunch and learns, and retraining of our administrators for different scenarios within the school. And we have a few more um, activities set up. We are looking to put a lot of that in place in the January and February months mm -hmm. so that by the spring we have all our um, officers retrained and prepared to address issues throughout the district. Okay, great. And do we have any live training sessions scheduled yet? Not yet um, scheduled. We're still working with the vendors and with the state to put um, put dates down. Okay, but but Share Nine One One is going to provide training videos for yes, yes, right? Yes. Okay. So Share Nine One One is a is a quite extensive system. Um, in addition to it being able to alert staff and um, and administration to what's going on, it also has a lot of training. So we will, all those training modules will be available to staff to review, review and look at. They also come with standard operating procedures that we'll also use to utilize different um, scenarios and know what to do as okay. things happen. Okay, and will, will we be able to know also um, staff that hasn't done, that haven't done the training yet? Like after a certain, like what, is there a timeline when everyone needs to you know, either watch the training videos or, you know, have the live training sessions? Yeah, that, um, the state requires um, a number of different trainings to happen to all staff and administrators throughout the year. So there are deadlines to when staff has to do things. Once we look at all of the training modules, when it comes to security, we'll put a date to that, so that and that will and that staff member would have the responsibility to finish any of those online one at a certain time. So we will know who has been trained, um, when they trained, and that they passed. Okay, great. Right, that concludes my report. Uh, policy. Well, I have Dr. Penn is not here. If I'm mistaken, then it's just uh, second meetings right now. Correct. Um, there really wasn't any policy here um, meeting this um, month because it was really the second reading from the um, what we discussed last month. Okay. And finance, we. Uh, oh, oh. There um, is an update though to the um, which we all got copies of is the update to the high school matrix discipline um, chart. That's not a first reading, but it's the revision we gave. We indicated the revision from last month that it was revised. We already approved the revision. They just sent us what was approved, just to make sure that we got the right one. There was a second, second email giving you a disciplinary policy, so you could, the regulations, so we could read it again. Maybe I'm being nuts this coming from us. City. Is it the first reading or is it an amendment to that? Last month we put on the, the high school matrix as a revision. Okay. So that was the first time, so this would be the second reading. This month is second reading for all of the, of the new mandates, the updates, and those that are being abolished. And the matrix was one of them, so it's a second reading. But you, you made a comment, Dr. 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 Adams made a comment. Something Just to remind everyone that the matrix was also revised and that's what's being approved. And there's no changes to the revisions that were originally sought. Is that, is that what he's saying? Huh? There are some changes. That's the reason why it was given. So if, it does, if we have to make it a first read, then that's fine. It'll be approved that next month as a second read. But we need to make sure that you all have the most updated with the revisions that um, were noted um, in this version that was provided. I also sent that in a communication to um, Madam President and Madam Vice President, um, as well as to Mr. Penner, the policy chair. So that's what I'm saying. So it's the first reading. So I would, I would like to get a look at it. Okay, on, on the docket, it is listed as a first read. Okay, uh, finance, uh, I went over the charter school residency verification, and I don't believe there was anything else discussed, correct? Oh, I did want to mention um, athletics, although uh, there really wasn't 
much of a report. I do want to mention that on our agenda, if you haven't gotten a chance, there is a assistant wrestling coach on there. So um, with the large amount of kids that want to participate in wrestling in the middle school, I think that's a, a good thing. So now it's uh, public participation. In accordance with board policy 0167, Yesbury Park Board of Education recognizes the value of public comment on educational issues and other matters of importance and provides members of the public with the opportunity to express themselves on school matters of community interest. The public comment portion of the meeting is not a question and answer session, and all public comments shall be directed to the board president and presiding officer of the meeting. Members of the public who wish to make public comments must be recognized by the presiding officer and provide his or her name, municipality, residence, and group affiliation if applicable. All public comments shall be directed to the presiding officer and are limited to three minutes in duration. Members of the public who do not follow the foregoing rules and are interfered with the orderly operation of the board meeting may be removed from the meeting. Uh, does anybody want to make a public com comment? This is your chance. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sean Hamilton, and I'm proudly celebrating my 25th year of teaching here in Asbury Park. I reside at uh, 84 Creek Road in Keensburg, New Jersey, uh, and I'm here to talk about the children. Sadly, I saw the same results, and for 25 years, we've been working through the same uphill battle. However, a couple weeks ago, we had this audit that you've been reading about. I watched nearly $2 million in salaries and benefits walking around schools counting kids, counting to make sure teachers were at their posts, that, job, sound, that, that schedules were filled, and as a result of that, the only thing we got back was several classes at Bradley Elementary and at Thurgood Marshall have been collapsed, resulting in not a penny's worth of savings. Those teachers will still get paid because it's in the budget for this year. I have no idea why we would do that. We have elementary schools that have no media specialists anymore, and you've seen our reading scores. That makes no sense. My friend Barry Seaman, 25 years in this district. And those who know him, he's a top-notch guy. Told last minute, with no reason why, that his class was being collapsed at Bradley, and now he's being transferred after Thanksgiving, three months into the school year, to Thurgood Marshall. With no explanation. All it did was make certain classes larger. And every single statistic shows that smaller class sizes results in more performance from children. It is just insane that now at Thurgood Marshall, we collapse a kindergarten class. Those current kindergartners were the virtual early childhood learners during COVID. And what did we do? We stacked 22 kids in one kindergarten room because God forbid we have two classes with 11 kids in it. Not a penny's worth of savings. I see a transfer of Sandy Shader, excellent teacher. Now she's going to be shared between Bradley and Thurgood Marshall as a reading specialist. When Manny Napolitani retired, it was the assumption that we'd have a full-time reading specialist at Thurgood Marshall. Remember, Thurgood Marshall has all the preschool classes. We've got the added class, four fifth grades, fourth and fifth graders. We need a full-time person there. There is no excuse to be splitting services, necessary services for our children. Again. All the smoke and mirrors aside, all the dancing aside, we're not saving one penny by collapsing classes and causing crowd classes to be more crowded. And we expect scores to go up from that? It makes no sense. Adding to the kindergarten situation, Thurgood Marshall, if any more students come into kindergarten, there is no room for them. They will not be uh, able to go to their neighborhood district school. I don't know how we're gonna handle that. If we have any kids with extra special needs, we do not have the services in the one kindergarten class at Thurgood Marshall to service that. I think these decisions were made very short-sighted, and I have no idea where the long-term plan is. Your time is up. Thank you very much. So you. Please discuss that in closed session. I'd appreciate that. Craig Bala, 1400 block of 4th Avenue. Uh, firstly, I'd like to 
extend my congratulations to Wendy Glassman for earning a seat on the board. It's a positive indication that the board may be heading in a new direction. I would also like to congratulate the incumbents, Anthony and Joe. For those of you who may not know, I was a candidate myself, and I believe that the incumbent's core message was not much different from mine, as it did speak to cost containment. Given the serious challenges faced by our district, I have lots of questions that I would like to pose to the board and to the superintendent. For tonight's public comment, though, I'd like to focus on one, and it needs urgent attention. I'm concerned about the rise in the number of fights in our, in our middle school. And it's concerning to hear about teachers being brutalized and sent to the hospital. I'm concerned about the reports of extremely chaotic dismissals at MLK. So, what's, what's causing all the tension? I happen to think that the problem could very well be a result of the new block scheduling arbitrarily imposed on students, short-sightedly, and teachers right in the middle of the school year. The responsibility of a superintendent, one responsibility of a superintendent, I believe, is to make sure kids are developing good habits. Abruptly changing course a month or two after the school year is well underway, suddenly forcing kids to sit for 80 minutes of instruction who are accustomed to 40 minutes is a lot. 80 minute classes just a few times per week is not a substitute for 40 minute classes five days per week. You're dealing with attention issues, behavioral issues, and the hindrance of developing good habits. This change would be challenging in any school, but in a special, but it has a special disservice to kids in a struggling district with below average math scores, below average reading scores. You've seen the results of our schools as compared to the state average and the national average. So, with these concerns in mind, I would like to pose two questions. One, will the classes be going back to meeting five days a week for math and reading in order to encourage continuous learning? And number two, why in the first place was block scheduling suddenly implemented after the school year had already begun? I welcome a reply. school, my son told me about the incident. I did not receive an email or a call about the incident. And Dr. Adams, I want you to send an email to me, ensuring me that that would never happen again in this district. Ms. Council, direct your comments to the presiding officer, please. I would like an email sent out tomorrow before a close of business day to ensure me and the community that that would never happen again in this district. I was not told there was a lockdown. My son had to tell me. When, this, when the kids got suspended for not playing football, it was a press conference in front of the Board of Education when parents was ranting and raving, oh, my kid can't play football. It was a press conference. Violence in our school, around our kids, no press conference, no emails to no parent or this community. So tomorrow, I'm demanding an email to myself and any parent in this district and this community, because the school is in our community, that this would never happen again in this district. That this, that school would be, continue to be a safe haven for not my son, but any other kids that attend MLK. And if I don't receive an email by 4 p.m. tomorrow, close the business day, I will be going to train. Thank you, Ms. Council. <laughs> Seeing there's no other comments, I'm going to close public comment. Uh, Superintendent, do you have uh, your data dash dashboard? It's already in the uh, ma'am. No comment. 
Mr. State Monitor, you have a report for us uh, this month? Uh, no, no report for this month. Thank you. Um, on A2, number 1A and B, the minutes, the regular meetings, uh, closed session of October 19th, and also, I think that's it, right? Can I have a motion? They accept the minutes? Go ahead. Roll call, please. Mr. Carrillo? Yes. Ms. Lazinski? Yes. Mr. Remy? Yes. Ms. Ricks? Yes. Mr. Rogers? Yes. Mr. Saunders? Yes. Ms. Allsbay? Yes. Motion passed. We're going to go into exec executive session, whereas the Open Public Meetings Act allows for the exclusion from discussion at the public portion of the meeting. Certain matters outlined, uh, whereas the Asbury Park Board of Education wishes to discuss such matters made and will make such discussion public when a proper conclusion has been reached. Now, therefore, be it resolved, the Asbury Park Board of Education will hold a closed executive session on the state, November 16th, uh, 2023, at Asbury Park, New Jersey, for the purpose of, I believe, uh, litigation and personnel events. Is that it? Negotiate, contract negotiations. And contract uh, negotiations. Can I have a motion? Second. Roll call, please. Mr. Grillo? Yes. Ms. Lazinski? Yes. Ms. Mr. Remy? Yes. Ms. Ricks? Yes. Mr. Rogers? Yes. Mr. Saunders? Yes. Ms. Allsbay? Yes. Motion passed. We'd be going into executive session at this point. Ladies and gentlemen, the board will be in closed executive session for approximately 45 minutes to an hour, after which time the board will return to this room uh, and take action if any is, is to be taken. Uh, no action will be taken in executive session. If any action uh, happens, it will happen back in public session when the board returns to this room. Thank you. I like to do 
official consent agenda for section C, which is items one through number eight. Thank you.
exponentially um, in, in other places they've done things uh, with this or be able to get some information. So with it going out for RFP, there is a clear criteria in which those who are putting in their bid have to provide that information. So it's not, you know, um, Miss Mary Sue's, you know, who does babysitting and, you know, after school coming and giving a proposal and it just being accepted. So there is a true vetting process of the individuals that meet the threshold of the RFP and then going from there, um, background checks, because again, we have all of the requirements for anyone to be responsible around children um, in an after school capacity, that they have to first meet some of those baseline criteria. My question is just to the attorney. Uh, are we able to look at, uh, or look at those uh, people who are uh, sending in the submission? Uh, yes. Uh, the short answer is, is absolutely yes. Um, additionally, uh, you'd be able to see all of the, the submissions that came in from all uh, parties that may have submitted something. So that's absolutely something that you. Um, and the members of the public could see, certainly, um, as well. Uh, and with regard to your questions concerning, you know, vetting, there are requirements, uh, statutory requirements that, be, that are imposed upon um, outside organizations that are going to provide those types of services like after school activities. And so I have every expectation that those folks that do apply uh, will meet, be able to meet those criteria and demonstrate that, that they are able to meet those criteria. Yeah, no, I I just don't know. Come back to Dr. Adams. That one hundred thousand dollar, ninety-seven thousand dollar man correct when I read it, uh, it basically says that if we significant if we got it, that it's a pool that the state has some people that you know we can look at that we can. So I know they have just like one buying cars, the state has a group of, a group of uh, candidates. Are we, have that, has that grant come back? That grant information has not come back. But we're looking also to see if this, we're looking at some of those people that uh, submitted to the state on, uh, for, this, for this after school program. So once the RFP is put out, those individuals who are interested will submit their proposal, um, and at that point, again, as Mr. Weiss has indicated, um, we'll have the, the list of those who fall within the parameters of the RFP, and then we'll be able to go from there based upon um, their offerings and ability to provide the most comprehensive uh, offering for us that fall within the bid pressure. I got a question since you're speaking about grants. Um, C4, number four, what will we be able to use that on? That, that, um, those monies are um, already allocated. Each school has already submitted their um, Title I programs um, in order and is encompassed in their um, regiment throughout the day. So these programs are already in place. This is acceptance of the final of that submission. So these are programs that curriculum instruction has already worked with each principal with, and there are various activities going on throughout the day from, from these money supporters. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I don't have we need no extra. Oh, man, I wish. I have a question about C2 uh, number six. So this is a this is a contribution from us. It's not the other way around. Either. This is a well, we're basically on behalf of the school district. We're donating what the space, the spot to the VNA. Is that correct? Yes, it's more like in kind services. Um, and so uh, we just met with them a couple of weeks ago to uh, reiterate the mental health component and some of the other services that the BNA uh, through the spot will offer the high school. Right now, uh, we've had to kind of relocate them, but this is 
actually sort of what they monetize as the cost that they would incur for the services that they would be providing. So there's going to be actual staff, like they, in a staff in the, in the They building. provide the staff. And it's for students and staff, right? No, it's for students. For just students. Okay. It's going to be great to see the spot being used fully again. And again, one of the things that we met with them about is the reporting aspect and making sure that the uh, submission of information in terms of the services they are providing to our students is uh, consistent with what the grant has outlined. Um, and so they are pretty much back on board. Um, we met with them for a couple of weeks, over the last couple of weeks, should I say, and um, we're looking to make sure that they're up and running. Mr. Kirill? Uh, yes to everything. Mr. Zinsky? Uh, yes to everything. Uh, but uh, C4 number two on the Thank you. Mr. Remy?